Jamaica versus Argentina, Paris, 21st of June, 1998. Jamaican team. Goalkeeper, Warren Barrett. Defenders, Frank Sinclair, Chris Dawes, Ian Goodison. Wingbacks, Steve Malcolm, Daryl Powell. Midfielders, Theodore Whitmore, Fitzroy Simpson, Ricardo Gardner, Paul Hall. Forward, Dion Burton. Argentinian squad. Goalkeepers, Carlos Roa. German Burgos, Pablo Cavallero, Nesta Sensini, Pablo Paz, Roberto Ayala, Nelson Vivas, Jose Camot, Hector Pineda, Javier Zanetti, midfielders, Diego Simeone, Matias Almeida, Juan Sebastian Verón, Leonardo Estrada, Marcelo Gallardo, Sergio Berti, Ariel Ortega, forwards, Gabriel Batatusta, Claudio Lopez, Herman Crespo, Abel Balbo, Marcelo Delgado. Set to take place in the French capital, Paris, in no less a stadium than the prestigious Parc de Prince. Even though the groundbreaking first World Cup match had already taken place, this was the prestige tie of the round for Jamaica. Suddenly, those men who hadn't been able to persuade their wives or girlfriends that going to the Croatia game in Lens was a vital part of their lives found no problem in persuading those very same women that the pursuit of tickets for the game in Paris was of maximum importance. Paris, the world's capital of romance, fashion, love and cuisine. Although most men of Caribbean descent would disagree with you on at least one of those categories. The scarcity of tickets had already been a problem. But now that the reggae men's next match was set in Paris, well, suddenly a lot of people wanted at least two tickets. A mixture of ingenuity and determination meant that many of those who travelled already had their tickets in their pockets. However, many people had travelled to the Paris match with no idea as to whether or not they would even be able to get in or get a ticket en route to the stadium. On arrival in the French capital, the less fortunate, ticketless fans began a desperate trawl around Parisian bars and ultimately outside the stadium itself in a frantic search for the passport that would take them past the barriers into the Parc de Prince. Boarded the coach, we're on our way. The national anthem comes into play. First, however, those who wanted to get to the match had to arrange their transportation. In Jamaican parlance, at least travelling to the match was no problem. A convoy of coaches left London and made their way to the port town of Folkestone through the English countryside. Reggae music strained in the speakers of the coach stereo systems that were not quite used to carrying so much bass. Once again... There was a mixture of those supporters who were based in the UK, those who had come from Jamaica, USA and Canada. The lost tribes of Jamaica from all over the world, who had made their way to England as their world cut home, were en route to France 98, cutting their way through the greenery of Kent. From Raga to Roots, Beanerman to Burning Spear, those who would bring their own unique flavour yet again to the World Cup were partying their way to the World Cup finals. Cleared Customs them take with the whole of the man them passport, but never look pan the man them one. Jubilation. Cleared customs. We're on our way. The singing starts. By the rivers of Babylon. Lively up yourself. We're going to Paris. On the shuttle. You want a whistle? Well, blow this. Lost in France. Where is the spark, the prince? Come in extra specs. Where were they? The Millennium Countdown on the Eiffel Tower showed 559 days until the year 2000. And all over the world, the problem of solving what had become known as the Millennium Bug was a hot topic. Let's hope that the reggae men's machinery has already been debugged. We're close, very close. We can feel the vibrations. The party has started. The first sighting of Argentinians. A clash of cultures. Confrontations. The violence that had occurred between supporters of European nations on French soil? No way! Those lucky enough to have tickets relaxed and merged into the colourful multinational party raving outside the stadium. A party, once again, provided courtesy of the fans in black, gold and green. This time, however, the Raga Roots reggae clan were up against South Americans. No slouches themselves when it comes to finding a rhythm. The sounds of the two sets of drummers, one a set of dreads, the other blue and white clad Latinos, 
together with a blast of horns totally drowning out the noise of the Parisian traffic, provided a friendly musical confrontation. Hmm, confrontation, well maybe that's too strong a word. Perhaps a better description would be to call this a fusion. Yes, a fusion of cultures, colours and music. Jamaicans and Argentinians were not in competition here, at least off the football pitch. They were playing this music together, singing together, dancing together. The bogle, butterfly, world dance, etc. meets the tango, flamenco, Latino boogie in a ragatinian style. Blue and white shirted women dance with black, gold and green shirted men. Black, gold and green shirted women dance with blue and white shirted men. Home-based Jamaicans tend to learn at least a little Spanish in school and the supporters in blue and white striped shirts all seem to speak some English. So all of this added to the music, dancing and singing meant there were no problems communicating. Make no mistake, both sets of fans were there to support their countries with patriotism in their hearts, but they seemed to recognise that there can be patriotism without hatred. There was no way that the rioting and clashes that the French had seen between the European supporters in Marseille only a week earlier were going to be repeated here. In fact, the truth is that all nations once again were present in Paris, in unison, to witness and participate in the fun. Everyone joined in the pre-match festivities. This was another cosmopolitan crowd, more so even than that seen in Lens. 17 years on from the death of Bob Marley, it was amazing to see how his music lives on internationally, as people of every creed, colour and description sang in the streets. There was a sound of laughter as old friends and new met up a nice stop France 98. And as suddenly as the party started, it was carried off the street and into the football ground to the shouts of Good luck, Jamaica! from the neutrals who had once again taken the underdogs to their hearts and even from the Argentinian fans. Has there ever been such an atmosphere created before a football match? A mere first round tie? Anybody who was there, whether neutral or supporter, would surely answer no to that question. If you were old enough to remember the 1978 World Cup finals, when Mario Kempes, Ricardo Villa and Ozzy Ardiles starred for the Argentinians, winners that year. If you remember the snow light ticker tape floating down onto the pitch and the pounding drumbeat, then the atmosphere created by these fantastic, fanatical Argentinians was pure fantasy. And even if you were too young to reminisce, then it don't matter. Whether they go in support of their team, the Argentinian fans are renowned for creating a spectacle and drama, all of their very own, irrespective of what happens on the pitch. These people had songs, songs carried from previous World Cup campaigns, and they sung them with a forceful, irrepressible passion. Just like those television pictures that zoomed around the globe in 78, once again the ticker tape floated down from above. The traditional Argentine welcome of ticker tape and drum had begun. Although this wasn't the romance that a few at the match had come to Paris for, sporting purists in the crowd recognised this to be a perfect opportunity to look back and romanticise about those great World Cups of the past. But this time it wasn't the Germans, the Dutch or the Brazilians striding out to face the Argentinians. This time, there in the Parc de Prance, out on that lush turf, alongside the flag of the men from the Pampas, was a flag with a gold cross on a black and green background. Two massive flags on the pitch. The Argentinian flag, a blue and white background with a flaming yellow sun at its centre, and a flag that told the story of the men from the land of wood and water. The flag of a nation whose motto proclaimed everything that this World Cup was all about. Out of many, one people, the flag of Jamaica. So far as international football was concerned, surely this was confirmation of the reggae men's arrival on the world stage. The national anthems were played and sung. The Argentinians louder than Jamaica, land we love. One of the Argentine fans explained that their anthem, Oid Mortales, when translated means, hear this, you mortals. Perhaps this should have been taken as an omen. Anyhow, the players were on the pitch, the drum boomed, the whistle blew, the stadium erupted, Longs was a distant memory. What happened next seemed to take place at fast forward speed. There was no slow motion here. Ortega scored, one nil down, been there, done that, worn that t-shirt. The feeling that Jamaica could get back into the match at that stage was not unrealistic. Whitmore was playing a dynamic midfield game. Powell had Ortega in his pocket. Batistuta could not get past Goodison or Sinclair and for periods Jamaica dominated. The attempts at a Mexican wave had broken down unceremoniously. Perhaps this also should have been taken as an omen. Disaster struck twice. Dion Burton, 
the man whose latter stage goals had brought Jamaica to France 98, was through on goal with nobody but the goalkeeper to beat. You could sense a black, gold and green celebration on the scale of the loan's half-time party was in the offing. When suddenly, some fool fool half idiot in the crowd blew one of the whistles the Jamaican fans had been carrying and Dion, thinking the referee had blown his whistle for offside or some other misdemeanour, kicked the ball harmlessly out of play. You've got to laugh at moments like these, because if you don't, you'll cry. Then Powell was sent off for a mistimed tackle. Still, with only 10 men on the pitch, 1-0 down to the former world champions, was not too bad, was it? There was a party at half-time anyway. Make no mistake, football was the reason that people were in the stadium. Both sets of fans were fervently patriotic, passionate people. That's the undeniable truth. But equally undeniable is the fact that soccer, or football, or whatever you choose to call it, is a game. A game involving 22 grown men kicking an inflated piece of spherical plastic. No more, no less. So believe me, difficult though it may be when I say that it really, really, really didn't matter that much to those inside of that stadium. In that crowd in Paris, when the second, third, fourth and fifth Argentinian goals almost mushed on the Jamaican goal people and net. 5-0, it mattered, but not too much. After all, there was still a party in the stadium to enjoy with the Argentinian fans, who swapped shirts, caps, scarves, anything they could think of with the Jamaican fans after the match. And that famous Jamaican sound system, Stone Love, were playing at some bashment in Paris later that night, so there was more partying to look forward to. It mattered, but not too much. Jamaicans have a knack of being able to put things into perspective, Where else in the world has any nation developed a national way of expressing the fact that whatever disaster has just happened, it's put into perspective apart from Jamaica? What expression is that? Well, Jamaicans do what they call kissing their tea in these circumstances. And amongst the mass exodus from the stadium, the reggae men's supporters could be heard putting everything in perspective. Yes, quite a few were kissing their teeth as they made their respective ways out into the Parisian evening. You've got to laugh at moments like these, because if you don't, you'll cry. Where is the dance? Paris by night. We're on the metro. You know this girl? The world sporting press had been out in force. And, upon discovering that the young woman in revealing kit, who had preened herself so successfully at Lons, had made the trip to Paris, they once again focused their cameras on her. Hmm... She had become one of the most photographed crowd faces at the World Cup, probably second only to Susan, the girlfriend of Brazilian ace Ronaldo. The journey home was certainly harder than the earlier journey to Paris, but remember, Jamaicans are people born of optimism. Although Jamaica's supporters now knew that their national team could not progress to the next round of the coup de mont, there was still the match against Japan to come. There was still the matter of trying for that first win in the World Cup finals. There were still three points in this competition. 